If you have your Bibles, would you uh, make sure to open them with me and, and be prepared to get into the Word today? We're going to be taking a look at um, the, the fact that we are designed for worship. That God has called us and designed us for worship. Worship is war. Can everybody see this okay? You know, get in the way of all the screens and everything, but this, we're going to use it this morning. So worship is really important. As we go through our ideas this year of building, the concept of worship is also engaging in the battle. It's also engaging in the war. And the fact of it is, when we started this series, we talked about that our concept of God is really important. And our concept of who we are in Christ is really important. And we talked a couple weeks about, ago about the fact that we are, we are designed, we are made for God's pleasure, we are made for a purpose and then today we're talking about that we were we were designed we are planned for worship your life is designed for power I got to tell you, and my life is designed for the power of God to be in our lives. So what is worship? A, a very current and very secular definition from online says this, the feeling or expression of reverence and adoration for a deity. Well, that's pretty good. But if we go back a few years, Webster's 1928 dictionary puts it a little more plainly. He says, worship is to honor with extravagant love and extreme submission. Now, Noah Webster was a Christ follower. He loved God. Um, he was a smart guy. He wrote the dictionary after all. Um, so he kind of brings into focus the significance of worship. I think it's really important that this morning we take the time to distinguish the attitude and heart of worship versus just the expressions of worship. Um, if we're going to define worship, we need to get to the heart of it, I think, before we really talk about it and really get into it, rather than just singing a song, rather than just clapping our hands or raising our hands or uh, any other kind of thing or giving or all the things that we do, they're very important. But I want to give us some definitions and reasons for worship this morning. The first one goes like this. Worship is the priority we place on God, on who God is in our lives and where God is in our list of priorities. You were created for worship. I like the way that the message paraphrase of the Bible in Romans 12, 1 puts this. It reads this way. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. You see, true worship really is a matter of the heart and ex is expressed through a lifestyle of pursuing God. True worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle pursuing God. If your lifestyle doesn't express the, the beauty and longing after God, adoring him through uh, extravagant worship of him, then I think we really have missed the point of what worship is. It's not just our gathering this morning as good as it could be, or and we might be engaged in a song or even in, in the preaching of God's word. That's all part of worship. Those are all important things. They are not insignificant, but worship is part of my lifestyle. It's more than singing. It's more than raising my hands. And all those things are good to express, but they're only symptoms of what is really happening in life. I have to grab my tools here. They're way over here. So if there's anything we get this morning, I want us to get that worship is a lifestyle. That cannot be expressed enough. I love and appreciate our gatherings. I love it when we get together, when we pray together in large groups or small groups. Um, I've had some incredible times of prayer with many of you this week in different groups and different settings, and it's wonderful. But my worship in my, in my life of God is something that I do all the time. It's something that we do all the time because we're living out loud the way God wants us to live. And that is worship because we love God and we're grateful for who he is and what he has done in our life. We, we live differently and it comes out of our life. We, we talk differently. We think differently. We have a different mode of doing things because we have a different master. We have a different one that we're serving than the world. A person who has a genuine experience with God will, will, 
who has not will long for some of these things, but they'll never be able to really put their finger on them. And people that are not engaged with the Holy Spirit's power in their life and, and engaging God in worship will not understand anything that I am saying this morning because worship is a lifestyle. The power to live and the power to, to succeed over the work of the enemy in our life, like Dave Ramsey says, live like no one else so that you can live like no one else. It's so true in the, in, the, in the spiritual realm. So worship is a lifestyle, but counterfeit worship is a heart condition expressed through a lifestyle of damaging addiction. You are what you eat. When we put the concept in reverse, we also get, we'll also truly discover why and what or who it is that we worship. If the best of our time, affection, and the best of our resources is, is, go, is consuming the philosophies of this world in one way or the other, you are drawn to the messages being preached by culture. Um, do whatever we want without responsibility. We're, we, we take whatever we want, no matter how much it hurts. We consume whatever we want without remorse or conviction. If it hurts anyone else, uh, we're worshiping ourselves, or we're worshiping others, or we're worshiping our addiction, we're worshiping money, and we're even worshiping Worshiping, and I got to say this, the demonic worship is spiritual and it is a defined by our addictions. If we find something that we cannot live without that is offered to us by this culture in this world, we need to understand something that we are worshiping that thing. Now, there's a certain amount of things that, that I uh, could do for worship. For example, Hannah and uh, Toby, would you guys just stand up just right where you are? I, I will just pick on them for a moment. We love these young people. They're in the church. They help out. They're, they're wonderful kids. I uh, Toby, you're a great guy, man. You, I love the way that you're personally playing the trumpet. I, you're, you're a good looking, strong kid. You're growing so big. And Hannah, I heard recently you got just a fantastic score on your, your test and you're just, you know, you're beautiful young woman and, and that's all great and dandy. Okay. You guys can sit down now that they're embarrassed. That is, that is in essence, worship in a way it's, it's a praise of what they're doing. Now, I don't idolize them so that I'm drawn into that, but, and that's the distinction. The distinction is when we begin to realize that there's something that we cannot live without, that addiction is worship. Worship is a spiritual power. Worship engages a spiritual power from God by the Holy Spirit, where we can live and walk victoriously in this life. When we put the concept and we think about this thing and there's other addictions in this world and we're, we're engaging with the demonic realm. And I wanna prove it to you. John 8, 44, Jesus says, you are the children of your father, the devil. He's rebuking every time he talks to a Pharisee, he calls him a name. I love it, yeah. <laughs> you hypocrite, you white witness of you serpents, you know, whatever. Anyway, so anyway. For you are children of the devil, and you love to do the things, ev uh, evil things he does. It's quite a rebuke. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. One version of the Bible says, when he speaks, lies are his native language. So every time he talks, he is saying what is untrue. And I want to, you to hear me now this morning is everyone worships with their lifestyle somehow. Every single one of us worships with our lifestyle somehow. How we live and the priorities of what we consume, where we spend the best of our time, money, and affections, all indicate the source of our worship. Many times we go into great debt because we have this thing that we so desire and it becomes a bondage to us, but we're bound to it because we have an addiction more than what God would have, you know, give, save, and live on the rest. That's God's order of our money, right? So when we consider the things in this world, we need to realize that the way out, and we're gonna get there, don't, you know, hey, Pastor, you're preaching at me, I'm preaching at me too. The way out is through genuine worship of God. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. He is the healer. Come on, that's good. I remember one time on a Sunday night, we were having a service and I realized part of the message was along this theme. Everyone on the planet worships something and the service was quite engaging and we were at the altar and we were praying and this man went out to his car and he had, I mean, 
bucket loads of CDs. Remember CDs? So many young people may not know what those are. They're little round molded discs of petroleum that have a, you know, in, in, better yet, records. Anybody remember records? They're, they're also molded flat discs of petroleum that, you know, you kind of put on a thing and, you know, anyway. Eight tracks, good bookends. Um, anyway, all this music and, and all of it was music that is engaging in the world. And, and there's a lot of music, you know, when you walk into a restaurant, you know, um, you, you just hear it, right? Um, I guess I thought you'd be here forever. Another illusion I chose to create. You don't love what you got until it's gone. You know, hard habit to me. You're the meaning in my life. Why is it when you go to a pizza place, they always play journey songs too. I mean, what is it with that? I don't get it. But he brought in all of this music and it was, you know, hip hop and everything that he had to engage in. And we spent that night breaking up all of his CDs because he was so impressed. All of this music, I mean, $100,000, a lot of it. We broke it up in the end of service. We're not having any book burning parties or anything like that here in my life today. But it was an indication of what God did that night in his life. God did something that caused a change of appetite. I want to say something to you. I'm not trying to make myself look good because Lord knows I am among the most imperfect on the planet. I have no appetite or desire whatsoever for those things. I don't really care one way or the other if somebody makes an album. I don't care if Jay-Z made whatever. Blow it out his ear for all I care. I don't know. All of those things in the world that speak about things that are reprehensible to God, I don't have any interest in. I have chosen for me and Pam for the most, you know, not that there's not stuff out there in the world that's not engaging and entertaining and fun. I'm not saying that we live in the culture, right? We are in the world, but we're not of it. But the things that excite me are things that are God things. Now, not... I haven't always been this way, and there are still some things that compel me and draw me in. I mean, if there's another motorcycle part I can buy, I don't know. The old flesh creeps back in. But what we watch, what we listen to, what we read in this culture, sex without covenant marriage, not just marriage, but covenant marriage, like biblical marriage, entertaining stories about the demonic we're captivated by today, by the media access, we have to literally millions of movies and hours of music and all the materials that have been created under the inspiration of every appetite man could conceive and the demonic, it affects us very powerfully in, in three ways. We have a very distinct person about who we are. It affects our, our um, mind. That's the psychic, the psychology. Then it affects the body, the flesh. It affects these two, first of all. Those things are the things that are really important. And the thing that's so fascin fascinating about the body is that the body creates pathways that cause us to become enamored with and addicted to things in this world. And I was recently, I was sharing, I think when I was talking to you this week on, um, and we were talking about how that the body creates actual pathways chemically. And I'll put this old medical mumble jumble in a nutshell the way that I got from and read it carves actual pathways in our brain, whether it's an addiction to a substance or smoking cigarettes or to pornography or to alcohol or, or the next high through drugs, our body creates a chemical process and the chemicals dig literal pathways in our physical brain that create a super highway, if we use it enough, to where we know is easy access to get to that place of pleasure or peace that we find from whatever that it is. So the body and its physical aptitude is actually creates a physical, it actually creates a physical addiction in the body where the body has a craving and a longing. 
There's certain things that are released endorphins, and, and these work along with chemicals that produce these super highways in the brain, and it carves in and creates an addiction to a way of life. And you know, this is addressed in scripture. Romans chapter 12 and verse two says, do not be conformed, the word formed, to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? It is the idea that God knows, God understands, he put our bodies together, that our physical brain needs to create another pathway by transforming the mind to receive the things of the spirit of God rather than what our flesh always craves. The second thing is the, the mind or the psychological part of it. A lot of people, a few weeks ago, we talked about the significance of how we view God is based a lot in life of how we view our earthly fathers. Well, father wounds in culture are huge, right? And they, they create a way of thinking psychologically that is very significant. And these things can change. It changes the way that we think. It changes the way that we process information. It, it makes us have different ideas about the world. And it has, makes us uh, make different choices and different decisions. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians. I don't think this is in your, this is not in your notes. It was supposed to be in. Galatians, Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. It's right there, kind of a halfway through the New Testament. Um, Ephesians chapter four and verse 17, look at what the scripture says about the mind or the, the, the psychological part. So it says in verse 17, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds or thinking as the NIV here says, they are darkened in their understanding. Again, a process of the mind and separated from the life of God because the ignorance is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Now what happens when the brain is encountered, the chemical pathway is developed and there it causes, that's the avenue toward rebellion. That's the avenue that the brain knows. It's gonna go this way because it hasn't been trained. It hasn't learned new stuff to create a new pathway. And the Bible goes on to say, having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality. So it's to indulge in every kind of impurity and they're full of greed. Why does the brain have all these pathways chemically that science will tell us? Because the mind has accepted the lies that have been fed to it by a culture or a generation that has been speaking all kinds of things that are opposite the things of God. Now the blessing of it is when we come to Christ, the Bible says our dead spirit comes alive. If we are far from God, if you have never had an experience with God where you have uh, accepted Christ in your life, scripture says that your spirit is dead. You have no spiritual understanding. And in fact, scripture says so much so that the people that are Christians have a much more understanding of the things of God because they can only understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Someone without the mind of the spirit, uh, the, the, the theologies and the thinkings and the writings of scripture and worship are senseless to them. They don't feel worship. They don't comprehend the things of God because their spiritual senses have never come around. And there are many that sit in church for years and years and never accept Christ. They never take a step toward knowing Jesus. They never have their spirit renewed. Why? Because the God of this age has blinded the eyes, the minds of unbelievers so they will not receive the truth. This is a very important thing in Ephesians chapter five, just the next chapter over in verse 15, he brings this out and tells us, he says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And then in verse 17, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what? What the Lord's will is. In verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs from the spirit. Sing and make music to your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father and everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once the spirit is renewed, a lot of things change or have the ability to. And I've said that before, but our mind and body 
Once we come to Christ, we might come to Christ when we're, you know, 12 years old, but our mind and body have had all 12 of those years. So the spirit has to take control over those things because they've had a lot of practice. Now, I, I want us to not make any mistake here about this engaging in the spiritual realm because we can treat these things. And I, I, there's been treatment um, for the brain connection uh, that we can receive from doctors. I'm not minimizing that. I know the significance of how the body, the brain can react and our actual bodies can react because of emotional scarring. You heard Pam's story years ago when she talked about postpartum depression after Jesse was born for a while. Um, she's a Christ follower, she loves Jesus, but she had a bout with that and it was really difficult. And I, I was kind of inadequate uh, up to help with it because I, I didn't understand it at the time. But we had four boys from uh, 1995 to 2000. So it was a lot of kids really quick. So we had these, these, these things and it stressed. And so there was some chemical things that could help relieve the pressure. And I know that there's some in this room that you, uh, you have medication that you take for this. But I want to tell you, and I know the same with her. God is the one who can bring deliverance for that. The, the other thing, the, the mind the, that, that comes into play as well, that, that we have these, um, the, the need for counseling. And this is what happens here. This is, this is treated chemically. This is treated with counseling. Counseling is good, amen? The Bible gives us prescription for counseling and, and both are not insignificant. They are very important. However, it is the spirit of a person, once we are born again, that has the ability, friends, to give you complete victory in these areas to help you get a new appetite for the things of God because worship is the answer to all of it. When I was a young man, there were times when I would be confused and the only place I would know to go would be to my knees to seek God and to call on God and to ask him for his help in desperation because the tendency naturally is for me to get angry and to, and to bear it out and to work in the body and the mind or to lash out, which I often did. But praise God for those times when I would find the Lord and his Holy Spirit would come and fill me. And my experiences with God since have been so precious. And there have been times where he has spoken to me and, and, and so clearly. And I've been able to, to say things in, by the power of his Holy Spirit. And, and he brought wisdom in the middle of confusion and peace in the middle of chaos. And all of these things are not just for me. I'm not so special or I'm not like this is for every believer. The experiences with God that you and I both need to have are true, genuine, and real. And we ought to pursue those with all of our heart. This is why worship is important because feeding our spirit brings freedom and healing. It creates new desires. Remember the scripture, the Bible says, uh, you know, if we give the Lord our best, he will give us the desires of our heart, meaning he will give not what we just, what we want, what our flesh wants, but actually put within us a new drive, a new desire, develop a new pathway, create a new way of thinking. That's what God's power does. Worship is a weapon against lies. Worship is powerful because of this very reason. Revelation 12, 10, scripture says, and I heard a voice in heaven saying, now salvation and power, the kingdom of our God and authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. I love this scripture because all the enemy does is accuse us, but God is greater. The enemy will terrorize you with fear, friend. He will capitalize on your greatest fear. He will whisper things in your ear in a constant barrage about your failures. He will take the pains from your past and he will scream them into your present about where you're going in the future. He will say, you're not good enough. You, you will never recover. You are a failure. You failed to serve God. You've broken his commandments. You, you're ugly. You're worthless. You have no value. You're, you're failure. Failures are too big. Yeah, that's right. Quit serving God. Quit loving God. Quit loving those who love God. Quit, quit, uh, embrace depression. These are the things that he says. These are the things that he whispers. Hopelessness and, and embrace aloneness. And he says this to you constantly. 
The Bible says that he is constantly accusing you. He is always telling you these things, and you know it. I'm going to prove it to you. These are awful words, but that's what he does, right? He's constantly accusing. Satan accuses Job in Job 1.9. Remember, he said, uh, Job, uh, does Job fear God for no reason? In Zechariah chapter 3, God shows Zechariah a vision of a figure of a high priest uh, Joshua. And in the fourth night of visions that he has, and it's a, it's a beautiful uh, book, the book of Zechariah. But anyway, he, he comes to him with, tre tre it comes to him with tremendous prophetic implications and concerning salvation of Israel and all these things. The chapter is full of it. The interesting thing about it, this meeting that happens is Satan actually tells God, he comes to God and he, he accuses Joshua. And he says, you know, this guy, th th this is the problem. Mankind is the problem. They're always failing. They don't fulfill your word. And, and he was the representative of mankind. These accusations are powerful, friends. And, and just like Job and Zechariah, the enemy is constantly accusing you. And in the accusation power that he uses behind it is he uses God's word, right? Because we know what God's standards are and his love and his power to us. He takes God's word, the very thing that we break often, <laughs> thank God for his grace, and he shoves it in our face. You failed in this area. You messed up. You, you were a bad dad. You were a bad mom. You were a terrible husband. You were a bad wife. And he, he says this constantly. And of course, this portion of, of Zechariah's vision is after Satan starts accusing him. But in verse two, God replies to Satan. He says, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. I love that. We worship friends as believers because we don't carry that guilt around. That guilt is not ours to bear because the shame and the guilt and, and it come from voices that remind us of how ugly and how broken we are and how much, how worthless that we are. But the war in heaven was, was epic, remember? So much so that God cast Satan out and it was thrown to the earth and we're still in this war right here. He's accusing us because we are made in the image of God. And, and, and it, it's a big thing. And the voices of the demonic realm are always threatening. His voice is always talking. He's always saying bad things. And I don't know how to draw his mouth. Maybe he's got teeth. I don't know. He's angry all the time. So even though he looks like an angel of light, but he's always accusing. And what does he speak to? He speaks right here. And what does this do? It says, okay, all right, no problem. I'll accommodate that. So when he says it, he whispers it in our ear and what happens? The mind says, okay, there's an escape. I know what the pathway is already. I've been down this highway many times and the body wants it. I'm here to tell you that the addiction and worship are just contrary things. They're both the same idea, but on opposite ends of the spectrum. You have the ability to distinguish between your voice and the demonic. And I want to show you how. Has anyone here ever talked to themselves? Okay. Now, I know this is true. Talk to ourselves when we go shopping, right? I mean, this happens. A guy says in his brain, I need to go buy a t-shirt. So we go and buy a t-shirt. A woman says to her brain, I need to go buy a shirt. Wait, I need a top. Maybe it's a blouse. But if I get one with flowers, that color, it won't go with the pants that I have and match the earrings with sapphires or gold. Oh, maybe I need a new blouse and a top. Well, if I get that, maybe I need a shirt too. And maybe if it's green, it won't go right with my pants that are lavender. And I just don't understand the matching of these colors. Oh, what if the women at the church, they change, they change their hair different, they're wearing different stuff. So what if I get the wrong kind of shirt? I own it's not a shirt, it's a blouse at the top. It's a whatever that it is. So a guy wants to get a shirt, a woman gets a whatever. But we tell ourselves things all the time. Women say, I'm gonna do this. A guy says he's gonna do that. Needless to say, we say these things and I wanna help equip us to know how we're listening to our own voice or the voice of the demonic. Because I will tell you, the accuser and the demonic are talking to you and I all the time and you need the ability to be able to discern how to do that. When you hear a voice in your head that suggests anything that starts with I, you're talking to you. 
When you hear anything that starts with I, you're talking to you. That's how we think. When we miss that turn, we say, boy, I wish I'd turned earlier. Or when you make a, a mistake, you say, boy, I wish I would have done that differently. Or, or you say, I wish I would have said this, or I wish I wouldn't have pushed send after I text that. Or when, when we use the smallest word of I, we know it's our flesh. We, we know that we're the ones. We say things all the time to whether it's good or bad, serving or self-serving. I want this, or I need that, or, or I'm going to, I want that car, or I want her, or I want him. When we use, when you hear words in your head that start with I, then you know you're talking to yourself, your flesh. I'm hungry. I know that. It's I am talking to myself. And that's the reasoning of my thinking. But the way that we can know the voice of the enemy, when you hear, hear the word anytime that says you, you can count on it that it's the enemy. You see, the you is an accusational word. You can take that to the bank and I can be sure of this. And I want to show you because that's the biblical pattern that the enemy always uses when he speaks to people. We find this same thing in effort in an in instance in the garden. When Adam and Eve are in the garden, what does God say to Eve? Has God not said you will be like God? He basically says, God, Eve is keeping an Adam. God is keeping something from you. You need to do this. You have to do that. We also find in Luke chapter 4, when Satan's talking directly to Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. He also says, if you will worship me, all will be. If you will throw yourself off of this temple, you will not dash your foot against a stone. The spiritual darkness is, is very significant because it says you all the time. The enemy, the demonic is talking to us. It's time that the church gets aware of this and fights back. Because the enemy will come to Josh. He'll say, Josh, you are too young. Phil, you are too broken. Mike, you're too loud. Uh, <laughs> Kayla, you can't do it. Mike, you're too short. Todd, you've messed up too much. Karen, there's nothing left. Just give up. You are broken. And he comes at us and he says, you, 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 you. When you hear that in your voice, make no mistake, friends, you and I are in a spiritual war. When that word you comes into your head, you can know the demonic is working to influence. You can't come in and invest and inhabit your life. I do not believe that in life of a believer. When you're saved and your spirit is renewed, he can't coexist. Jesus said that. How can, how can the, the spirit of God and the spirit of the devil live in the same place? They can't. Jesus said it's impossible. So don't be afraid of that. But he can influence the believer. He can whisper in your ear and say, Suzanne, you are no good. You, Jan, are worthless. You, Larry, can't do it. You, 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 you. If you are the one that's always saying, I am so stupid, I'm ridiculous, I want to let you know you're beating yourself up. That's a duplicitous idea in thinking. But when you hear you, you have failed. You have messed up so badly take it to the bank from the biblical example that you are now engaged with the spiritual right there whispering in your ear. You know, God wants us to have victory over this. And of course, to be counterintuitive to this is, vic is to walk in victory. Friends, we know that when he says these things, we have something to realize. We need to realize that the accuser, according to the scripture we just read, has been thrown out. He has been defeated. He's like the big mouth at school. It's always saying what he is. You know, nobody likes him. Or maybe you work with some, maybe you're married to somebody like, um, they're always talking. They're always bragging. I'm this, I'm that. This is where the words of James are so powerful. So in James 4, 7, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. How, why? And he will flee from you. How can he do that? Why does he flee? Because he has to. 
There's no argument, and, and he has only words, right? In 1 Peter 5, 8, right? He's only got words. He goes around like a roaring lion. In other words, he's got this, it's this little kitty, tiny, tiny little kitty cat, this little kitten. You know, when he opens his mouth, it just sounds really big, but it's just like, meow, meow. I'm coming after you, meow. That's all he's got. It says he's like, he's got a big voice, big threat, but you turn around and look at him because he's been cast down. He's defeated. And I know that there are some of you that, and, and myself, all of us have been under attack this way. And, and I know there are those that are suffering. They're, they're, you're self-loathing. You self-deprecate. You, you want to be free from your ongoing struggles with depression, with loneliness, with so many things. You call me during the week. You're hurt. And you have all these things that are going on. And I mean, you've been saying, I is enough, right? I mean, that'll hurt you enough, but it hurts. It hurts, it hurts you when you begin hearing the you. And the power of this is to realize that when you hear you, that that voice of the toothless kitten is what's speaking in your ear. When you hear that, what does it do in you? It makes you want to worship. It makes you want to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation know before all men, the Lord is at hand. A lifestyle of worship silences the accuser. Psalm 8, 2 says, From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies. To silence the foe and the avenger. Praise, worship, silences the foe, silences the accuser. To say, shut up to the mouth of the enemy to say closure. Now, when I was a kid, mom didn't like us using shut up. She didn't, we didn't say shut up. Be quiet. She often told us to be quiet, but we could never say shut up. It was something we just didn't say among many other things. We just don't say it. Um, but when we say that to the enemy, there's no problem. I mean, say it however you want to say it. Shut your big fat face. I mean, I really don't care. Double, I'm just telling you right now, in Jesus' name, you're nothing but a meow. You're nothing but just a cat's meow in my ear. You might sound big. You might be trying to be reminding me of how I failed. But I want to tell you that in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have no voice. Through genuine worship, we tell him. We tell him to shut up about our life, about our, our condition in life, and all these things that just seem to want to drive us. True worship reminds the enemy of what he's powerless to do. And there are several things. He can't make you sin. James 1, he can't make you fear death. He can't take your stamina, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Um, he, he can't um, uh, pester you after you've resisted, James 4, 7. And he can't do anything without God's permission, Job 1, 12. He can't steal your faith, Ephesians 6, 13. He can't com commandeer your future, praise God, John 10, 20. No one will snatch you out of my hand, Jesus says. And he can't win, Revelation 12, 10. So, hey. When we create an environment in our life to have a lifestyle of worship, we do something in war. We do something that deals with the things that seem to challenge us the most until this challenges us more than this, or this inspires us more than this, the process is still backwards. Even though we've been regenerated as believers in our spirit, you've been born again, it's time to feed this part rather than listen to this. Now, Scripture tells us that God, in Psalm 22, 3, when we worship, we create an environment to experience the presence of God. Experiencing God is important. If you've never experienced God, you need to seek him until you sense his presence in your life. If you never experienced God, really you need to start with his word and pray his word in your life. He will touch you by the power of his Holy Spirit, I guarantee it. Psalm 22, 3, the, and, um, the ESV says, you are holy and thrown on the praise of Israel. Psalm 22, 3 in the King, King James Version that we so often make quote is, but thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. The idea is that God inhabits the praises of his people. Inhabits or enthroned is a word called yushah. 
And it, it means to be occupied or to dwell in, um, a heritage, an inheritance or a possession. That God lives there, his actual presence. When you worship, you engage his presence. When you don't worship, you will never sense his presence. You might feel his conviction for sin and ask for forgiveness, which is most of our life we spend praying that. But friend, I got to contend that as a believer, if we begin to walk in a lifestyle of worship, we'll turn the table on the enemy. It changes our attitude in the way that we think. Anyway, the scripture uses this word in, in Psalm 22, as you know, as a, as a messianic psalm, it's a beautiful psalm written much more for Christ talks about his, none of his bones being broken. It talks about the crown of thorns. It talks about them uh, gambling for his robe. There's a bunch of prophecy. Psalm 22 is one of the many messianic psalms. It's given to us in scripture. It's best known for the trial, death, and res, uh, crucifixion of Jesus and all that, his death. But in this this context of the scripture, we can't miss this very idea that is here for God's people, that it's Jesus speaking himself through Mo, through David, as David is prophesying really with his pen as he's writing this psalm, God, your presence dwells in the praise and worship that I give to you. So worship is powerful. Worship is everywhere in culture on different levels for different things. But when we worship God, we are inviting his presence and it comes in our life when we live that way. We begin turning off the noise of the world and enjoying the things of God. A counterfeit worship is the one thing though that the enemy desires above all else. You see, worship of God is so powerful and it is the thing that, that gets mastery over these things and the enemy knows it. And so he wants that more than anything. It is the reason that he fell in his pride. He longs for that adoration. There's such power and exaltation and adoration and he desires that for himself. That's what he wants the most. If we look closely at, the, the, at him, we understand the five I, I wills that he gives in Isaiah 14.3. Look at what Satan says about himself. This way he was cast out of heaven. He who said in your heart, I will listen to heaven above the stars. I will see my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly that reaches the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make uh, myself like the most high on Wednesday night. We're going to look at what these I wills represent. So if you've been missing Wednesday night, Bible studies, you've been missing something. Amen. And those that are here, they've been engaging and going like, wow, this gets over. Anyway, God's response, I love in verse five, we'll get to that part later. He says all this I will stuff, it's all prideful. But in verse five says, but you are brought down to Sheol. <laughs> in other words, you think you're high, I'm bringing you down. You think you're so exalted, I'm going to make you nothing. God's response is powerful. And, and, and you heard of the edemic nature that we're born under this, this bound to Adam's sin and his sin and all this. And all this was about uh, Satan's sin and his, himself. And, and we have the same nature. And, and, and what do you look at? I'll prove this to you. Satan looked at himself and, and, and caused Adam and Eve. What do you look at when you see a picture of yourself with people? You look at you. Don't look at me so smug like you don't. You look at the picture and you determine whether it's a good picture or not if you're in it. Come on now, whether you got just the right smile, whether you look slender enough or whether your hair is perfect. I mean, if, it's, if you're not looking good in that picture, even if everybody else is, it's a bad picture. It's all about you. We have this in us. It's hard to combat. Satan wanted to steal God's worship for himself. And this is what he did in Matthew 4, 8, 9. He even tries to get Jesus to worship him. Worship is always expressed. Satan says, you need to bow down to me. Why? Because worship is expressed. Some of you men know, well, I'm not that expressive. <laughs> 220 pound guy takes a pig skin across the line. You're pretty expressive. Worship is expressed. Music is a significant vehicle in worship. It really is. And uh, it provides a vehicle that helps us to engage God. And you might say, well, I'm not that much of a singer. Or I don't play. That's okay. But music stirs our souls in amazing ways. It's truly a gift from God. Every time I hear, and the rocket's red glare, the bomb's bursting in air, I am moved. Music is powerful. All the more a vehicle to reach God. And so this is what Satan was. Satan was created actually in his very being 
with images carved of musical instruments. We find this in scripture that, that in, it speaks of, in Ezekiel where, where God is speaking to the king of Babylon, but he's really speaking to Satan, just much like Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't rebuke. He, he was talking to Peter, but he was talking to Satan. So he rebukes the king of Babylon and he directly to Satan, he speaks to the king of Tyre the same way. Um, and he does this and he says in Isaiah 14, 11, your pomp is brought down the sound of your harps. So we have a string instrument. I used this illustration last year in Ezekiel 28. He does the same thing. And, and down there in verse number 13, the workmanship of your timbrels, your tambourines or your percussion and pipes or your wind instruments, um, were prepared for you on the day you were created. They are in your being. So Satan was created with the three categories of instruments that we have in the world. The stringed ones, the percussion ones, and the wind. They are the three categories of instruments in the whole planet. He was created with these in his nature, in his very physical being, the spiritual being. He's got these in him. And he wanted and desired that worship. And if you read Ezekiel here, chapter 28, all the way down, you'll find all the things that he does with it and uh, uses the word workmanship as he, uh, the instruments and all these things are put in him. And he has, he was given great authority and, 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 and talk, it talks about that because he, he has these instruments in him that the Lord appointed him, the scripture says, the anointed cherub of worship, basically in charge of that worship and that worship in heaven. Why? Because it's powerful. Isaiah chapter 61. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me, would you? Isaiah chapter 61. I want to read the whole chapter and close with this idea. And then we're going to worship. We're going to sing. It's one of the ways we worship. Isaiah 61. We'll recognize the first part of it very clearly because it's a prophecy that Jesus read about himself in the temple. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and uh, release the darkness of, for the prisoner and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them the crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and what? A garment of praise instead of spirit of despair. You know, I was riding home the other day and the guys were working on, we're working on the siding on the side of the house and replacing or the church building, placing some windows. And, and as I was riding home, there was all this stuff going on and a certain amount of heaviness. And I just quoted the scripture, Lord, you have given me Lord, the opportunity to put on the garment of praise. You see, we have it, but sometimes we leave it in the closet. When we have a spirit of heaviness, oh, it's so easy just to call a friend and get the counsel that we need. Oh, it's so easy just to turn to that addictive thing again and put it back because that's the highway to our peace. These are the pathways that we know that, that work really well for us. And all the time God is saying, wait a minute, if you'll do something else, so we go to the closet and we get the garment of praise. And he says, what's it for? For the spirit of heaviness. He says, it's for the spirit of heaviness. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. The purpose of our praise is to give worship to God, to give attribution to his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. So much prophetic connection here. They will renew ruined cities. They'll have devastated, they have devastated generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards and you'll be called the priests of the Lord. You'll be named ministers of our God. You will feed the wealth on the wealth of nations and their riches. You will boast instead of your shame, you'll receive a double portion 
instead of disgrace, you'll rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion of the land and everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations, their offspring among the peoples, and who see them, all who see them will acknowledge that they are people of the Lord. They are blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord, for my soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments, there's that garment again, of salvation and a radiant robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a, a priest, uh, as a bride adorns herself with jewels, for as the soil makes the sprout come up in a garden, causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. There's a reason that before they go into battle, the worshipers went first. There's a song that is just a chorus that came out last two years ago. It just simply goes, this is how I fight my battles. And it's one line of a song is sung over and over and over again, but it makes perfect sense because it is my worship, it is my adoration that I am saying to God, God, I am engaging in this fight and I'm gonna put on the garment of praise for the spirit of happiness, I, uh, of heaviness. I don't care whoever is leading the song sings like a frog. I don't care if the, the worship band that was in my player isn't what I really like today. I don't care, I'm just gonna turn everything off and I'm just gonna worship you. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.